Uh, so what we wanted to create was some sort of study guide. And with this study guide, what we wanted to do is make it feasible for us to actually read the Bible and process what's going on. Not just read it in such a way to where uh, we read it and we're just checking it off, but read it in such a way so we can process it and uh, kind of learn from it and grow from it. And so on your table, you should have two pieces of paper. If you don't, I'll come around right after this to kind of help you with that. There are two pieces of paper. The first one looks like this. It says Genesis 1, 2, 1, 1 through 2, 3 on it. If you don't have it, don't worry. i got plenty more to come around and walk around with you. Uh, so you should have this, which has our scripture on it for today. And then you should have something that says the Genesis study guide on it. What we're actually going to do now, this is our study guide for the month of January and February. What we're actually going to do now, instead of just having a time of preaching, which I'm going to do afterwards, we're going to have five to ten minutes here where you can read through this and then go through some of the questions on the study guide. If you see the Genesis study guide, there's about ten to fifteen questions on there. You can look at all those questions, whatever questions you want to go over, you can. But we're going to focus on the four bolded questions. So what do, what do I like about this chapter? What did I learn about God? What do I learn about humanity? And what words and phrases are repeated? What patterns do I see? So I'm going to give you, we're going to give you five to ten minutes to do that. We're going to have some music playing. If you don't have these two pieces of paper, don't worry. I'm about to walk around and give that to you, all right? Does anyone have any questions about that? It may seem kind of awkward. It may seem kind of weird. Uh, but it'll be something that I think will be good and can lay a foundation for the future. So I'll walk around and give these and then uh, just take some time to read through the scriptures and go through a couple of the questions. All right, so that might have been a little different for you, and that's okay. Uh, we'll talk more about that as we go through this. Today, my task, the task that I was given, was to talk about Genesis chapter 1, which is really the creation story of the Bible. And uh, I'll try to scoot that out a little bit. And see if it's awesome. So my job was to talk about the creation story, which is Genesis chapter 1 and part of Genesis chapter 2. And if I'm honest with you, I was a little overwhelmed because it's just so much information within that. As you guys were just reading and going through it, I mean, it's a lot to process and it's a lot to go through. I've been listening to a sermon series on the book of Genesis, and this guy covered Genesis chapter 1 in 12 different sermons. And so I'm not going to do that, obviously, but... Uh, and nor would I do that if I had the time to. It would take me two to three, but I just felt a little overwhelmed by all, all of this information in it. And so as I was sitting there processing it, thinking about it, I thought it might be good, instead of me just straight preaching through the book, was to bring this back to the study guide that we created for the months of January and February, which is what you guys were just looking at. How the study guide works is you read six chapters a week of Genesis, starting the first full week of January, which is now. And each, each, that breaks down to about one a day or so, I take one day off. And uh, when you do that, you go to the study guide that we have handed out and it has a bunch of questions for you to process and think through as you read, read the chapters. And it's not something you can just do by yourself, you can also do it with a group. Me and my wife will, will read it together and process through it and it's really helpful and, and super good. And so what I wanted to do today was to kind of show you how I kind of go through these questions. I'm going to answer four of these questions from, the, cha from uh, the chapter of Genesis 1, and in doing so, hopefully it can open up some thought and some conversation about how you can go through and kind of read using this study guide here. And so the first question I always ask myself when I read the Bible, after I get done reading a text in the Bible, is what does this tell me about God? Uh, a lot of us think that the Bible is a story about morals, a story about heroes, a story about uh, feeling, uh, stories about feeling good about yourself, but the truth is the Bible is a story about God. And so whenever you read the Bible, the first question you need to ask yourself is, what is this teaching me about God? After you go to that part, then you can go, what does this teach me about myself? But you ask yourself, what does this teach me about God? And so when I was reading this, I asked myself this question, and I seen, what I seen was multiple things, but the one thing that stuck out to me is that I seen that the whole Trinity was present in the creation process. What I've seen about God in this chapter is that the whole Trinity was present in the creation process. Also, if you go to that first slide for me, we actually see this in, in two places. The first place is Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. It says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The first thing we see is that the Holy Spirit is actually present in the creation process. It wasn't just God the Father uh, using his power and authority to create the universe. The Holy Spirit was there and was active, and it's like he was forming and shaping the universe as God, was God the Father was creating it. Then we also see in verse 26, it says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. 
He says us. He doesn't say my image. He doesn't say in the image of me. But he says in our image, which shows that probably, or what we'll see later in Colossians, that Jesus, God the Son, was present as well. That he was there in the creation-making process, as Colossians would say, everything was made by and through the Son. And so what we see here, what we learn about God, is that the whole trinity was in the process of making the universe and making this earth. Now, why does this matter? I think it matters for us because we see that while God is equal, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all equal, while they're all equal, uh, they function differently. They all function differently. Uh, and this, this is important to us because if we have a view of God the Father as uh, someone who dictates power over the rest of the Trinity, then that's what we believe about the world around us. That's what we see about the world around us. Because what we believe inside comes out in our actions. What we believe in here actually comes out in how we live and what we do around us. So if we believe God the Father has more power over the Son and Spirit, we start to live that way. And then here's what happens. We view the people around us as having more value depending on, upon what they bring to the world around us. Let me walk through a couple examples of this. Uh, the first one is this. It's the rich and the poor. See, if we see God the Father as someone who has more power than God the Son and God the Spirit, we start to think that those who are... <laughs> Those who are rich and those who we see those who are rich as those who have more power and more authority over the poor. And we see them as those who are more valued. Uh, let me give you an illustration here. Let's say two families walk through that door right there. They walk in through that door and one family has uh, looks wealthy. They have a lot of money. They have a lot of power. Uh, you kind of know them from the community. And let's say at the exact same time. A second family walks through that door as well. And they, they seem like they don't have a lot of money. Their clothes are kind of tore up. Their clothes are kind of beat up. Um, and they're known in the community as not having a whole lot of money. What, what person are you going to talk to? Which family are you going to walk up to? Now, maybe you're like, I'm not talking to anybody. My goal is to get in and out of church as quickly as possible, so I don't want to go up and talk to anyone. Uh, but which one are you drawn toward? Too. Maybe some of you, it's more towards the one who has money, the family that looks like they have some power, what they can bring to this church. And maybe others of you, you're actually drawn towards those who look like they don't have money. And those who look like maybe they're, they're a little more poor. But the truth is, is what we learn about God is that while they have different, uh, different uh, functions, they're, they're all equal. And the same is true about people. While we function different in this society, like God made us all equal. And so we shouldn't be drawn to one more than the other. Another example of this is kids and adults. They have different functions, right? But they're still valued the same by humanity and by God, or at least they should be. Uh, let me give you a real practical example of this. About a, a month and a half ago, Pastor Steve came up to me and said, Hey, how would you like the youth group decorating the church for Christmas? And in my head, I was like, oh, that sounds miserable, but we'll do it. So I agreed because he's my boss, and so we decided to do it. So we threw a party. It was either like right at the end of November or the very beginning of December. And we came in here at 4 o'clock and we started decorating. And it was a disaster. I mean, it was chaotic, craziness. It was fun, but it was, it was a beautiful mess. Uh, not to mention my two toddlers were here as well. And so it was, it was crazy. And if I'm honest with you, they did a good job, but they didn't do as good of a job as some of you other people would do in here, as some of us would do. Uh, because they're kids and you know they're just doing the best they can and they're busy playing around and having fun. Uh, what society would tell us is, hey, kids shouldn't be allowed to decorate the church. Let the adults do that. That's the adult's job because it should look perfect and good and right. But what we learn is that, hey, this isn't just our church as adults. It's the kids' church as well too, right? And if we want them to be a part of the church, we have to let them function in some ways in the church. And so we see while they may function differently, and it might not be as beautiful as if adults would have decorated it, uh, it's still, they're still as equal as we are. They function differently, but they're still equal. One last example of this is men and women. A lot of times, men are seen as more valuable, which they're not, but they're seen as more valuable. And I think a lot of that has to do with just, if we're honest with ourselves, men are stronger than women. The average man is stronger than the average woman. Uh, maybe not all men are stronger than all women, but the average man is stronger than the average woman. And so we often value men as more important than women in society. But what I love about Jesus is Jesus says the exact opposite of that. He says that, well, he doesn't say the opposite, but he says what is true is that men and women are equal. They're valued the same. And we see this in the life of Jesus. 
He was actually the first feminist, if I could say that, the first good feminist. And uh, what we see is time and time again, he's, he's allowing women to do the same thing as men in ministry. The, the greatest example of this is who's the first person that Jesus appears to after he resurrects? is Mary, who's, whose testimony wouldn't even been taken seriously if she wasn't court. Like she couldn't go to court because she was a woman at that time and testify, yet Jesus appears to her. We see that Jesus values all people, no matter how they function in society. And so as I read of this, I'm saying, what am I learning about God? What I learned about God is the whole Trinity was, was present in this, and while they were functioning differently, they were all equal. So what do I learn about myself? I learned that humanity, why we all function differently, we're, we're all equal. And no one, had, even if people may look like they have more power and look like they have it more together, and maybe older or younger, female or male, we're all made in the image of God. And so that's what I learned about God, and so I learned about humanity. The second question that I asked myself is after what do I learn about God, I, I try to find what kind of patterns. What do I see that's repeated in the text over and over? Uh, I'll read some of these things that are, are repeated. The first thing that I've seen is it said, God said. God said, I've seen that over and over and over. So we see in verse 3, and God said, let there be light. In verse 6, and God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And in verse 9, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. What we see over and over is this idea that God said, God said, God said. So, so what do I learn from seeing this pattern? I see that God has the power to, to speak things into existence. That while we cannot actually truly create anything, we can take what God creates and shape and, and mold it. God is the one who has the power to create. God is the one who has the power to speak things into being. And because of that, we should submit. Another pattern I've seen over and over is that what God creates is good. If we go to the next slide, Austin. Uh, we see God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together. He called seas and God saw it and it was good. In verse 12, the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kind, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. God saw it and it was good. In verse 21, so God created the great seed uh, creatures and every living creature that moves and with the water with which the water swarms according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw it that it was good. Everything that God creates is good. As I, as I read, I see that pattern. So that means that God is unable to create anything that is evil. As, Genesis, or as James says, God is the one who brings down every good gift from above. And so everything that God ever created in the entire universe is good. Now, you may be asking a question if you're a thinking person. Well, if God created everything good, then why are there bad things? If, there, if God created everything good, then, then why is there evil? Did God not create that? So did God not create everything? And I think that's a logical question to, to ask yourself. C.S. Lewis has two really good answers to this, I think. The first one is this. Let's say that you're at home. And it is completely pitch black outside. There's no street lights. There's no nothing. The moon's not out. The stars are hidden. It's pitch black. You cannot see more than one foot in front of you. You're inside your house. Your house is well lit. When you open your house door, is that darkness going to come streaming in and overtake the light that's inside? No, it's not going to. Darkness cannot do that. Now think about the exact opposite. If it's pitch black in your house, and there's light outside, but you have like light blocking curtains up, and so you can't see anything in your house. The only reason you can move is because you know your house. When you open your front door, is that light going to come streaming in your house? Absolutely. You're going to be able to see. Darkness can't overtake light, but light can overtake darkness. And darkness is really just the absence of, of, of light. And so God didn't create bad things. God didn't create evil. Evil is just the absence of when God's goodness is around. When God's goodness is gone, that's what you get, is evil and darkness and brokenness. It's just like with light and darkness, right? When darkness, darkness can't overtake light, but light streams in and overtakes the darkness. Another good way that he explains it is like this. C.S. Lewis, he, he says that there's no bad uh, key on the piano, right? Like, they all sound pretty all on their own. They're all good. The problem isn't when uh, you play a piano key, it's when you play a good piano key at the wrong time. That's when it sounds bad. Or when you play the, a good drum beat at the wrong time, or a good, uh, good uh, guitar strum at the wrong time. It's not that the, those things are bad, it's when you play them in the wrong place. God didn't create anything bad, it's when we use God's good things at the wrong time that evil exists. It's like food. Food isn't bad, it's very, very good. 
But if you live a life where you're constantly overeating, that's when food becomes bad. Another one is sex. Sex isn't bad, but it's when you do it in the wrong place at the wrong time. And anger isn't even bad, right? Like, if someone comes into your front door and you have a kid sitting on your couch, they pick up their, your, that kid and throw him over their shoulder, throw him in a van and drive away, you should be angry. And that anger should force you to take action against that person, right? God created anger for us to be used in a good way, to help protect and, and defend. The problem is, is that most of us use anger in the wrong way at the wrong time. Nothing by itself is bad. It's just when we use it in the wrong way at the wrong time. And so everything we see as we read this that God created, it's good, it's good, it's good. The last pattern that we see here, uh, that I see here, and there's multiple patterns in Genesis chapter 1, is this idea of evening and morning. So verse 13 says, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. Verse 19 said, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. Verse 23 says, and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. What we see is this pattern of there was evening and morning. What we learn from that is God is someone who is not a God of chaos. He's a God who creates order. He's a God who creates uh, who creates, uh, takes chaos and makes it good. Uh, he's a, a God of, of order. Now we're going to have a real quick conversation here. And for some of us, this conversation is going to right over our head. And that's totally okay. Not because you're not smart enough, just because you don't care. And there's times in my life when I've had conversations like this where I don't care. And so you're going to zone out for a couple of minutes. And I'm totally okay with that. That's going to go over your head. But I think this is an important conversation to have. So when people look at this scripture... What often comes up is the conversation of how old the earth actually is. Uh, this idea versus the new earth and the old earth idea. The new earth idea looks at the Bible and says, okay, it's been about 6,000 years since Genesis chapter 1 after we go through all the, all the uh, genealogy. And so the earth is about 6,000 years old. And so they look at this verse and they read it as, okay, this was a literal 24 hours, uh, an evening and a morning. Literal 12 hours there, 24 hours altogether. That, that the earth was created in 24-hour periods, or that God created everything in 24-hour periods. Now, there's people who believe in something called old earth as well, and those people believe that the earth is actually millions, if not billions of years old, and that the universe is billions of years old. And so what they read when they read this section of scripture is that in between each of these evenings and mornings, there was actually maybe millions, if not billions of years in between each one because we're on God time and not not human time. And so people read this and read different things, okay? I'm going to give my opinion at the end and tell you what I think is right. But what I want to lay out before you is that both of these are logical explanations. And there's many pitholes in both of these ideologies that people can point out. I think what's more important is that people are able to have conversations about these things and talk about these things. What I see happen in more conservative churches is if someone believes that this isn't a literal 24 hours, they get told that they're wrong and that it's heretical. And then what I see in more progressive churches is that if someone believes in a literal 24-hour period here, they get told that they're stupid and they need to trust science. And what I want to say is that both of these are legitimate, and I want to point out the potholes in each of them. Uh, the first one is if you believe this is a literal 24 hours, what I often hear of this argument is I take the Bible literally. When I look at this, I read it literally because I take the Bible literally. And I think that's good. There are places where you should take the Bible literally. But there's also places where you don't take the Bible literally. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 45. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet and be thrown into hell. John 6, 51. I'm the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, speaking of his body, right? And that bread that I will give you for life of the word is my flesh. So if we were talking literal, it would be literally his flesh. Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Mark 9, 47, and if your eye causes you to sin, tear, tear it out. And it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes and be thrown into hell. Right? So if we take the whole Bible literally, then we should literally be cutting off our hands and plucking out our eyes and hating our family. Right? Now, I'm not saying that we should not take the Bible literally, uh, but I think as Christians, we should be people who try to figure out the context of what the book is saying and figure out, okay, is this literal or is it not? Now, if you start reading the Bible like Adam and Eve aren't literal and Jesus dying on the cross isn't literal and Jonah wasn't literal, then you start to have a problem there. But we need to be Christians who use tools to figure it out. So just to say that Genesis chapter 1 needs to be read literally because 
we read the Bible literally, that's, that's not true, because there's a lot of places we don't read the Bible literally. Now, on the flip side, for people who will say things like, uh, who believe that this was more than a 24-hour period, that there was millions of years in between each day, it wasn't a literal evening and morning, I'd say a couple things. Number one, you will tell me to trust the science. Well, what I would say is science is often wrong, and we all know that with COVID going around right now. It's, they have flip-flopped a million times on what is right and what is wrong, and no one really knows, and we're all arguing about it thinking we're right. Science is often wrong. People who believe, how we really, most of you don't care, I know, it's going over your head, and I'm okay with that. But uh, how we get to the idea that the Earth is millions of years old is by light years. And so uh, we look at light years, and okay, because this is so many light years away, we believe that the Earth is millions of years old. Well, there's a lot of people who believe that how we measure light year is actually wrong. And so how we get to that, both Christian and non-Christian scientists as, as well. I would also say for people who have a hard time thinking that this is a literal 24 hours, you might have a hard time believing in the supernatural. Like, everything has to make sense to you all the time, and if not, then it can't be true. Another thing I would say is when you start to argue this, what often happens is that this makes the door open for evolution, that we have evolved from animals when you start making this argument not to take this literally. I'm not saying that's always the case, but that's often the case. And while Christians can believe in microevolution, which is things changing over a slow period of time, we don't believe that we can change from one kind to another, from like apes to humans. We don't see that. There's actually no scientific proof for that. But we have scientific proof of, of microevolution. We don't have it of macroevolution. And so both of these theories, I can poke holes in. And you know what that shows me? Is that maybe we don't actually know what is right. And we can have ideas and we can talk about these ideas, but we don't actually know. Maybe it was a literal 24 hours. Maybe it wasn't. That's not the point of Genesis chapter 1. That's not the point that, we're trying, that the author is trying to make. What he's trying to show us is that God created the universe. Uh, people, when, they, when uh, this book was written, Genesis was written, they wouldn't have even understood the idea of cosmology and how the world was made. When they read this, they would say, God created the universe. Now, here's my opinion, if you care. What I believe is that God made the universe in a mature state. So I believe he made the universe to look like it's millions and millions of years old, but in all actuality, he created 6,000 years ago. In the same way that when God created Adam, he didn't create baby Adam. He created uh, uh, adult Adam and Eve, and they had belly buttons, and they weren't fetuses. They were, they were made mature, and so I believe the same thing about the earth, right? Okay, I know, uh, please pull yourself back in if you zoned out there. I just thought it was an important conversation to have because I think we have to be okay with people who believe different things about us when it comes to the Bible, right? We have to be able to have these conversations and have these di uh, dialogues because if we don't, we're going to, as a conservative church, if we're honest, we're going to be kicking people out who would want to like really trust science and look into that if we can't have this type of conversation. Okay, so first question we looked at is what do I learn about God? Second question is what patterns... What uh, repeated words do we see? We got two more and we'll fly right through these two. The third thing I look at when I read the Bible is what do I learn about humanity? What do I see about myself in the scripture? And the obvious thing, which I'm not going to spend too long on because Steve's going to look at chapter 2 next week of Genesis. What I see is that we're made in the image of God. It says this in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, right? What we see is that we're made in the image of God. Now, that doesn't mean that we look like God, that physically we look like God. It doesn't mean that, like, somehow if we were to stare, stare in a mirror and God was to stare, stare in the mirror, we would look the same. What it means to be made in the image of God is that we share characteristics that God has, that we should do some of the same things that God can do. Like, like we can love like God, and we can have happiness like God and joy, and we can have anger like God. We're made in the image of God. However, other things are not quite made in that image, right? I know you love your dog, and I know you love your cats, and they're awesome and they're great, but they're not made in the image of God like we're made in the image of God. We are different and distinct and, and unique. Uh, your dog cannot feel love in the same way that you can. I'm not saying your dog can't love. I'm sure Speckles loves you or whatever your dog's name is. But it doesn't love you in the same way that a human can love another human. Because that's only made for, for God and for people who are made in the image of God. And so what we see is because of that, we are representatives of God. So what do we learn about God? What repeated patterns do we see? What do we learn about humanity? And the last question I always like to ask, and I do this at the end, not at the beginning, because I want to process it is what did I like about this scripture? As I read Genesis chapter 1 and part of chapter 2, 
What did I like about it? What kind of stood out to me? And what stood out to me is actually in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. You can pop to that next slide, please. It says this. What did I like? Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. What I liked was seeing that God actually rested. Now, why would God rest after creating everything? Is it because God needed to rest? I think he was doing it as an example to us that we need to rest as well. In the same way that Jesus was baptized in the water, he didn't need to be baptized for forgiveness of sins. He's perfect and good. But he did it as an example to us. So I think that this is showing us that we need to rest as well. I'm going to walk over here and grab something for an illustration here. Some of you are grinders and workers, and you work really hard, and you just want to accomplish everything, and that's awesome. Some of you are more laid back, which is cool too. Uh, but some of you just keep working and working and working and try to get everything done that you think you can do. And you're actually pushing yourself too hard. What you're doing here is, I got an uh, old pepper shaker, and there's a little bit of pepper in this. What if I was to take my water bottle that's completely full and dump it into this pepper shaker? But what would happen is, I fill it up, 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 fill it up. At some point, once I get it too full, what's going to happen is it's going to start overflowing everywhere. If I don't take time to go and dump this pepper shaker out of water to refill it, it's just going to start overflowing everywhere. And that's what some of you guys are doing with your life. You're just filling and filling and filling and filling, and you're never getting true rest. You may take 10 minutes to flip through Facebook or 30 minutes to watch a show on Netflix, but you're not getting true rest with God. You're not spending time in his presence to rejuvenate and, and rest and, and be with him. And so I like that because I needed to hear that. Like I needed to see, because I'm one of those people who like to grind and think I can work and accomplish everything. But I'm actually very, very limited. I, I had this happen to me like uh, last year at this time as I was like coaching football and I was the offensive coordinator trying to raise my kids and spend time with my wife. I actually put all my time and focus into stuff that I couldn't actually get done. I spent too much time coaching football that I didn't get to spend time with God. And so I literally had to step back and scale back. And so some of you probably need to do that as well. And so as I read that, I really liked that. And what I also liked was we've seen this pattern after every day of creation that it said evening and morning, evening and morning, evening and morning. At the end of Genesis chapter 2 on the day 7, we don't see that up there. It doesn't say it was evening and morning. I was trying to figure out why is that so. After I was reading that, what I realized as I looked at some commentaries is what, what they believe is that um, God is trying to say that he's still present today, that he's still at work today. While he created the whole universe, he's still present in that universe. It's not like God is like a grandfather clock where you pick up the spindle and you just let it go and it goes back and forth and back and forth and just steps back. God is actively present with us today and is with us today and God is still at still at work. And so here's what that means for us as, as we wrap up here. Here's what that means, is that God from the very beginning had a plan. And his plan was to create Adam and Eve, and he knew that sin would come into the universe, and then he knew that eventually that Noah would come, and he knew that, he knew that Abraham and Isaac would, and that Joseph would come, and eventually King David would come, and Solomon would come, and that eventually that King Jesus would be sent here. God was working a plan that Jesus would come and be, live the perfect life he couldn't live, die the death you would deserve, and rise from the dead. But he also had a plan that you right here in 2022, that he would save you and show you who he is, and that he would be working in your life. God is active here right now, right in this moment right here. So, here's what we'll end with before we go into communion. Uh, some of you right now, 2022, you're making resolutions that you're going to change and you're going to fix this about yourself and you're going to be different and you're going to be better. I'm pretty sure you've probably done enough resolutions to know that eventually those resolutions are going to give in. And while you can try and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and try to change yourself and work on these things and to some extent that might work, eventually you're going to give in. What you need is some sort of outside source to change you. And what we believe as followers of Jesus is the word of God that changes our hearts and changes us who we are. And some of you are trying to change, but you're not coming to Jesus to change. You're just trying to be good enough and be better enough and work hard enough. What God says is, as you get to know me, I change you. I work on your heart, and I'm going to change you from the inside out. 
the reason that we wanted to put forward this study guide is to show you that you can read the Bible. Like, you don't have to be a pastor, you don't have to have some sort of training, you just have to ask the right questions. When you read a te text, ask yourself, what does this teach me about God? What does this teach me about me? What patterns do I see? What do I like about this? It's as you process the Bible that God uses it to change you. You don't just read just to check it off your list or to get through your daily uh, devotional. You read to allow it to change you, and to do that, you have to ask yourself the right questions. And so we're going to tell you that you can take this study guide home. And we have more of them printed out. Wrong paper. We have more of them printed out, and we have them available online as well. And I really believe if you take time to do this study guide, that God will work in your heart and change you. Uh, you might change if you just try really hard and work really hard. But the truth is, is you need the Spirit to be working inside of you. And this study guide is a great way to do that. See, on the back of the study guide, we have uh, January through February marked off of what you can do to actually read through the whole book of Genesis as we preach through it over the next few months. And so this is yours to take home. I know that what we just did was not the most exciting. I know that uh, it wasn't like a typical sermon, but I think it's good for us to see here's how we can read the Bible on our own at home. Okay? Now we're going to trans uh, transfer to a time of communion. Thank you, Zach. If you want to open up your elements, you can. Get ready for that. Pull up the scripture here real quick. So a lot of times when we read about communion, we actually read out of Corinthians and later in the book. I was reading in chapter 10, and I read this. Chapter 10, verse, uh, verse 16, it says, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? So it says when we come to communion, this, this uh, wine or the juice for us and this bread or this cracker for us represents, and we, represents the body and blood of Christ, and we participate in that. But then it says this, which was really curious to me, verse 17. Because there is one bread, we who partake... Are many are only one body, for we partake of the one bread. So that's kind of complicated. It doesn't make any sense, but it may not make sense on the surface level. But what it's saying is, as we take this, we take this as one body. as Just as Jesus' body was one and his blood was one, we as followers of Jesus take this as one body together. That may be hard for us to comprehend because everything in American culture is individualized. Like, you can go to the grocery store and pick from 70 different types of marinara sauces with slight differences in them. Uh, and if you go on Amazon, you can pick from thousands and thousands of different types. Or go to the grocery store and look at pizzas. Like, 60 years ago, there weren't that many types of pizzas. And now you can go and you can literally pick from hundreds of different types of pizzas. Everything is so individualized to us that our relationship uh, with Jesus has become very individualized as well. It's just like me following Jesus. But what Paul is saying here to the church in Corinth, it's not just you taking it, it's you taking it with one another as one body. And so uh, what I'm going to do is pray, pray that we'll take this as one body and then we can take the elements together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your life, death, and resurrection. We thank you that in doing so, you didn't just make us right with you, but you made us right with each other. You made us one body of people who are following Jesus. We pray that, uh, that we will understand that. We will understand that Jesus' death was not just for us individually, but for us as a whole. We thank you for his life, death, and resurrection. That in doing so, he made us right with you. And that our sin is, is not just hidden, but deleted. And it's not held against us. We pray that as we take this, we'll take this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. You may take hold. sound like back there they're ready to go so I will pray one last time here and we will be free to go God we love you we thank you for your word and that your word is only the true thing that can change our hearts while we can do some external things to change some of our actions we need the word of God to change us from the inside out and so we pray this year that we take seriously reading your word uh, and that we take it seriously but we know that we can do it like like one thing that prevents us from, from actually reading the word is feeling like incapable or impossible, Lord, but it's, it's not impossible. We just got to take a few minutes a day and ask some simple questions, Lord, learn more about who you are. And so I pray that we be a church that do that. 
that does that. That will uh, take the study guide seriously, follow after you. We thank you, Lord, that you did die for us. We thank you that we have a relationship with you and that we get to meet together here today. We thank you that you created the universe and you're not just a God who sits back and, and watches, but you're a God who's active and present in our life today. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.